everybody. Um, let's go ahead and get started. My name is Boris Monduk. I'm the founder and editor in chief of Crypto Law Review, and I'll be moderating this panel, which is titled Blockchain Regulation Beyond Finance and Compliance. And we're extremely honored to have a group of panelists that will be speaking to us about the intersection of law and blockchain, um, specifically with a view towards increasing stakeholder participation. And I'll take a moment to introduce everybody. So we have uh, uh, Pai Miwa, uh, who's the Director of FinTech and Innovation at the Japan Financial Services Agency. Um, Yuta Takanashi, who's the Deputy Director for Research on Blockchain at the Japan Financial Services Agency. Andy Ryan, a core researcher at the Ethereum Foundation. Hi, <laughs> Miyaguchi, uh, the Executive Director of the Ethereum Foundation. And <laughs> Fabian Kopenstelle, um, the founder of Luxo and um, the de developer of the ERC20 uh, standard, the developer of the ERC20 standard with the Kanye Matitin, among many other development achievements. What we would like to do is start off with a presentation uh, by Miwa san uh, uh, latest efforts at the G20 level, and I'll hand off the uh, floor to Gek. Thanks so much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it is very my pleasure uh, to give you the opportunity to speak at the DevCon, uh, which is the uh, most dominant Eastern based uh, conference here. So, uh, I'm also honored to be uh, present here as a status of the representing as a regulatory community, but uh, whom, uh, of whom the somebody uh, think it is an enemy <laughs> here in the South. But uh, it will be a first appearance from the uh, regulatory community at the table maybe. So, uh, yes, let me get to my uh, presentation. Before starting my uh, physical part of my presentation, so I, let me briefly touch on the uh, what we do. Uh, as the Japanese could say. So, uh, as illustrated here, uh, the regulatory coverage in each financial uh, authority are very various among major jurisdictions. JFXA uh, acts as the uh, integrated, integrated financial uh, authority, embracing the four financial uh, sector regulations and uh, oversights, so including the uh, banks, the securities, the insurance as well as uh, uh, crypto asset exchanges. Uh, compared to the other regulatory bodies, uh, in global basis, uh, JFS has a broader capacity uh, and includes the policy planning function. Uh, and, and, uh, so uh, we uh, very uh, seriously uh, take the, uh, our policy issues in timely manner and also address the uh, first change in crypto asset market by multifaceted function emitted to us. So, uh, Okay, so uh, let us move on to the physical parts. Uh, first of all, uh, the choice of the venue uh, for this year's debacle has resulted in uh, truly timely uh, because uh, Osaka gained good momentum of G20 uh, in the area of the assets and the decentralized financial technology. Uh, just three months ago, uh, G20 Osaka summit was held uh, here in, uh, under Japan's presidency here in Osaka and where G20 leaders discuss the uh, technological innovation of the financial system, anticipating the uh, decentralized technology will be deployed with an environment uh, where, uh, where uh, the benefit can be fully attained. Uh, the G20 uh, leaders have reached a particular uh, consensus on the accepting the necessity of the wider stakeholder dialogue envisaging the fast-moving uh, decentralized financial technology. The first slide illustrates the except of the Osaka Regional the highlights of This is a... Uh, okay, so uh, the, uh, in another aspect, the uh, choice of being in Osaka may be able to meet the uh, fundamental nature of the Ethereum community because the uh, Osaka had undergone the fully meaningful development. Uh, by building the specific financial architecture with great uh, creativity, uh, especially in combining the commerce with the finance from uh, over 300 years ago. 
uh, it can be said that Osaka is the origin of the financial innovation and the foundation of the current financial architecture. Long before the era of the uh, current bank centric financial system, uh, maybe around uh, 100 years ago, the long distant settlement system, uh, currently bank wire system or something. So, uh, through the exchanging bureau, was operated in Osaka for the transaction with a distant customer, such as uh, those in Tokyo. Uh, the financial, uh, innovative financial architecture was also extended to the, uh, the area of the commodity future exchanges in LICE, uh, which was the first to be launched in Osaka, dating back to the 17th century as the origin of the derivative transaction in the world. Osaka's well-developed uh, financial architecture had been underpinned by a dominant merchant group who played around Osaka. Such uh, market players manipulated and modernized the accounting system through double entry uh, bookkeeping over 300 years ago. That eventually leads to the basis of the current venture technology. Next slide, the, uh, over 300 years uh, have passed since then. Uh, cumulative wisdom of the financial architecture from the past may be fully transformed since open the distributed ledger technology uh, could, could fully replace it and uh, may allow for the provision of banking services with that bank. In addition, in addition the long standing double spending issues in the digital cash is technically resolved in combination with the consensus algorithm and uh, economic incentives through the mining and the uh, decentralized network like provided by the internet. And uh, also, an immutable niche uh, feature provides uh, revolutionary changes of learning uh, digital ventures in the last uh, And in addition to that, uh, uh, blockchain, uh, which originated in Bitcoin, is going to extend further applicability through programmable Ethereum based applications. Uh, contract with the counterparty will be smarter than before, and such Ethereum based solutions will give rise to the evolutionary changes in finance and commerce for which the past merchants may have been wrong. Next slide. Uh, as stated in the G20 Osaka Declaration, uh, crypto assets uh, do not pose material risks material threat to the global financial stability at current junction. The market cap of the uh, crypto assets are still quite small uh, in the global financial system as compared to the uh, incumbent financial services. Uh, in addition, uh, many people observe that the uh, widely accepted deployment of the blockchain may not come to in the near term uh, because uh, we recognize the underlying uh, technological immaturities as to the uh, scalability and so uh, But at the same time, uh, we recognize that the wide acceptance uh, of the blockchain would bring the great potential to replace the conventional rule and change the game and uh, even transform the way of the trust. So, uh, as you know, the decentralization is a principal factor of the blockchain. Crypto assets uh, underpinned by the blockchain are uh, basically uh, designed to attain full P2P transaction where any economic intermediary such as crypto asset exchanges are not anticipated in the transaction. In fact, uh, Satoshi's paper 2008 uh, noted the motivation in the first paragraph. This perfect known uh, intermediary system designed by cyber developers uh, may give rise to the changing the role of regulators. In general, the regulator, regulatory power is sustained by the uh, specific economic agents, uh, which standards like you know, a physical regulatory target, such as the banks, insurers, or crypto asset exchange whatsoever. In reality, in the uh, current crypto asset businesses, Japan, uh, Japanese financial agencies impose a requirement uh, to the crypto asset exchanges uh, to count as anti-money laundering by introducing the uh, customer's identification rule. The rule is motivated by the standard made by the part of uh, Financial Action Task Force, which is the uh, governmental uh, organization uh, which uh, sets the standard of the anti-money laundering. So, uh, 
in this slide. So let us think of the uh, why regulator uh, they have such regulations. Uh, we should be aware of the uh, our motivation first. Uh, financial regulators generally have three coherent regulatory uh, goals, such as to attain the stability of finance, to protect the investors and the consumers, and uh, also uh, to prevent the financial misconduct, including uh, financial crimes and anti money laundering. But contrary to the uh, Satoshi's motivation, uh, the current crypto asset business is sustained by the economic agent such as uh, crypto asset exchanges, uh, uh, current, current regulatory structure, which impose the regulation to crypto asset exchanges, do not pose a full guarantee uh, to daily transactions. Since, we, since we, have a, we face a new type of risks that emanate from the uh, technology layer. Uh, in crypto-based uh, transaction, uh, inherent nature of the uh, cryptography provides uh, technological risks such as a uh, cipher compromise that may be susceptible to the current mining structure uh, or the new threat of the attacks from uh, the cyberspace. Under this anticipated situation, so who care such risks? Uh, the regulation uh, could not cause any to the uh, technology issues or uh, to, uh, could not provide medicine uh, to such a risk. In the future, uh, decentralized exchanges and layers network that operate automatically will eliminate uh, current, agent, uh, current agent business such as exchanges. Uh, assuming uh, this sort, uh, we may face the reality of losing uh, explicit uh, our regulatory target will face uh, new challenges uh, as to further we are uh, able to sustain our regulatory building or to ensure uh, the, uh, the robust security and to attain the, the privacy uh, and the traceability issues simultaneously uh, such new risk heavily uh, weighing on us cause a difficulty in achieving our regulatory goals. So, uh, in addition to the nature of decentralization, uh, as mentioned before, uh, the autonomous nature uh, in blockchain may prevent us from uh, stopping the cutting the transaction once the system starts its operation. Uh, artificial uh, system controlled by the programs would never stop, regardless of the third party intervention, as if we are fighting with the cost. Uh, if we take the policy that prohib uh, prohibits the whole uh, crypto asset transactions, it may help activities go over boundary or go underground in the darker market. So, uh, in addition, uh, anonymity nature uh, also poses a new incentive for hiding uh, the, the privacy, uh, which could reduce uh, uh, the traceability and the difficulty in the possibility. So, uh, earlier in my explanation, we touch upon the scalability issues. As you know well, uh, as you know well, uh, Vitaly uh, pro uh, provokes uh, scalability to uh, that implies underlying trade-off of uh, blockchain scalability, uh, referring to the security uh, and decentralization, which should be achieved simultaneously. While this Twisting uh, try and represent the developer uh, problema, but uh, other uh, people may face new problema. Scalability enhances the more scalable transaction uh, that blockchain can be attained. The greater concerns over privacy and anti money laundering risks users and regulators may have. Uh, moreover, uh, many users may seek for more convenient. Uh, transactional convenient services should be connecting to the other uh, crypto asset. Uh, maybe uh, in the future, in the future, uh, interoperability uh, will be a new variable item which causes a complex problem. So, assuming this, so how should we, uh, how should blockchain stakeholder uh, lay out the governance of uh, decentralized financial system? 
uh, at the moment, uh, key actors such as developers, uh, academia, uh, security experts, and the regulators in the blockchain uh, ecosystem are uh, still uh, independently worked uh, without enough communication. So in, even under such a fragmented development, uh, it seems that at minimum, every stakeholder uh, do not pose, uh, do not hope to make a further friction and unnecessary dispute in crypto asset uh, transaction. So, uh, proper coordination will be of necessity. Uh, communication itself uh, will contribute to the reducing the gap between various stakeholders while we recognize it is hard to define the common languages between us and uh, to create a place for the uh, building for the uh, consensus among us. Uh, especially from the regulatory perspective, uh, facing the past uh, inno innovation, uh, fast paced innovation, we may firstly react not to lag behind the innovation. But uh, amid no consensus of the value in technology and with commu without communication uh, of its stakeholders, regulator would face a dilemma between the criticism of mobile regulation uh, uh, by those who uh, emphasize the innovation and criticism of, criticism of the procrastination by those who stress the need of the consumer protection. Thus, we need to uh, proper, uh, properly recognize the underlying value of the technology. So the balance between degradation and innovation and expectation among uh, various stakeholders. So thinking the design for proper governance is truly important. So uh, uh, maybe uh, in light of the future decentralized financial system. So this slide, the uh, JFSA have been taking a step toward the healthy governance in communication with the uh, stakeholders. So uh, we call the uh, uh, blockchain mountain hosted, fully hosted by us, uh, represents a lot of the stakeholder meeting. Uh, this round table uh, extending capacity uh, with the uh, participation uh, of the uh, major international organizations such as FSP, IMF, and OECD, and uh, as well as the, uh, the, the academic community uh, from the MIT, uh, Georgetown University, and Cambridge University, and Cambridge University uh, from Japan side. So the, as well as this, so uh, industrial experts on sec uh, security and uh, crypto asset developers have also invited to join us. So before uh, the G20 summit in Osaka, uh, G20 finance minister uh, and central bankers meeting uh, in Osaka, also have in Fukuoka, sorry. Using this opportunity, we hosted the high level seminar on innovation and uh, the future design of the governance system and the multi stakeholder financial system. In this session, too, uh, we invite the, uh, Mr. Adam Black, CEO of the blockchain, uh, Blockstream, uh, who is the uh, kind of the king of the yeah. and uh, Krasnod, uh, CEO of the Dutch Central Bank, uh, as a representative uh, of the finance regulator community. So, and then we also invite the, uh, the, the Shichiro Matsuo from the uh, academic side, uh, who uh, uh, has a very excellent in securities and uh, uh, cyber issues. And the uh, moderator uh, was uh, Jim Rai, who is uh, uh, called as the uh, Internet God, uh, very famous in, in Japan, so uh, uh, he's moderating the session. So we, in G20, so we hold the much stakeholder discussion uh, with the you know, various uh, area, uh, in the current financial businesses. So uh, lastly, we once again uh, advocate creating the venue for stakeholders discussions very, uh, of necessity uh, to discuss the future design of uh, governance system. In this context, uh, we really appreciate the, uh, the Eastern Foundation to, to, to give us the, uh, such a great you know, opportunity to have a, a stakeholder discussion. Uh, and uh, we would like to evolve the communication, the further discussion uh, in the next stage toward the stakeholder forum next March.
uh, in Tokyo from this is my professor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mimi-san. Um, and maybe a good jumping off point uh, would be one of your slides where you introduced an extended Vitalik's uh, scalability trilemma to essentially give us the idea of scalability, privacy, and compliance. And we can attach uh, several stakeholder groups to these three categories, just as, a, as an example. So privacy, for instance, could be focused on users, scalability perhaps on developers, and compliance perhaps on the needs of regulators. Um, so first question would be, what do you see as the biggest challenges to multi-stakeholder governance today? And maybe a broad question for the panel, anybody who would like to respond? Thank you both. So, uh, firstly, uh, I think the, uh, there's a a lot of difficulty in the uh, creating the uh, common language between uh, stakeholders. But uh, uh, through the discussion uh, of the uh, blockchain roundtable uh, mentioned before, so uh, uh, we kind of spell out the uh, many uh, important aspects. So uh, through the discussion, of course, uh, in the uh, technical side, maybe uh, there are uh, current dilemma to achieve the scalability as well as the decentralization and security issues. But through the discussions, uh, many people uh, currently are uh, very uh, focused on the issue of the privacy, but privacy enhancing technologies, uh, such issues. So uh, uh, through the roundtable discussion, so we address, or we spell out the, uh, the uh, underlying uh, kind of motivation you know, by, by developer and by regulator side. So uh, through the discussion, so we create a you know, right side to, kind of dilemma or you know, twisting triangle issues. So uh, scalability, privacy and the compliance issues. So uh, I think the uh, first step is that, you know, the important thing is what is important is to discuss, you know, with the various stakeholders. So uh, of course uh, we, do not fully understand the uh, developer's motivation, but uh, through the discussions, so we recognize the ah, okay, I think uh, uh, you know, such a, in case of privacy issues, of course, uh, we, uh, you know, based on the enhanced technology, uh, enhanced privacy, so uh, we are very concerned about the traceability issues. But the, uh, on the other hand, in developer sites, uh, they are very much uh, focused on the the issue of the uh, fungibility of the, the crypto asset because the uh, uh, current uh, fiat currency is a you know, uh, very uh, privacy enhancing or anonymized, uh, anonymized based uh, paper currency. So, uh, uh, through the discussion, so uh, we recognize the current regulator, uh, sorry, developer's motivation uh, to use uh, the privacy enhancing technology. So, uh, so <coughs> firstly, we take a step for further discussion. So it's important. <clears throat> um, so I would also like to add to this is, as it seems right now, like from the financial side, that there's a lot of focus on uh, the financial regulation because it's kind of like we're coming back to okay, Bitcoin is the thing. And now we have these assets, and we have a twenty uh, or two hundred billion dollar market, but. The problem which I'm seeing is that there's a lot of things happening that are not necessarily financial, that could be seen financial, but this can also be seen as uh, commodities. And um, the question is, that where do you do, the, where do you make the boundary between uh, what should be heavily regulated and what not? Because the problem with that comes that many of these things are very experimental that are happening here, and. Um, by <clears throat> putting up a lot of burden of fulfilling, uh, li getting licenses, uh, and, and a lot of the rules which currently exist that want to be now applied to these crypto assets, they were made for a completely different system. You know, they were made for a paper-based, trustee-based system with intermediaries, uh, a lot of them. 
Um, and a lot of those regulations, like, it's like, I mean, it, it's like putting horses in front of a car, you know? The car already drives, you don't put the horses there. <laughs> so when we are sitting in, in, we're ending up in uh, situations where it becomes very complicated then for uh, startups to just do things, you know? Like the last few years we had a lot of uh, innovation because people could just do it because there was not too many regulations. And now it seems like a humongous package of like a lot of rules comes on top of like even the smallest developer who just like writes a smart contract and builds a wallet, for example. So that, that's kind of a hard balance. So I think the, the, the most difficult thing is to like have the common understanding for is good for society. So, so currently the regulators have maybe three goals, as we also said. So the financial stability, investor consumer protection, and preventing illicit activities. So these these are not like we we regulate, but <clears throat> the ultimate goal is to achieve these three goals. So if if something different other than like regulation achieve these three goals, we don't need to have regulation. So uh, so of course as as you mentioned that uh, consumer protection so the privacy is very important for the protect consumers, but at the same time we need to like catch a criminal to get get them into jail. So that is also important. So it's not like the privacy and traceability or the preventing financial crimes is not a good or bad thing. So the both of them is important. So, so it's kind of competing good thing. So how we can balance or balance between consumer protection issues and also the financial crimes issues is very difficult to achieve by only by regulation. Because as as we also mentioned, so blockchain based financial system has several characteristics that makes us very difficult for us to enforce regulation. We can write regulation, it's it's relatively easy, just right. And just prohibit, but still it's very difficult to enforce this regulation, especially in the Bitcoin system or Ethereum blockchain, because it's autonomous and decentralized, and also sometimes anonymous. So, so especially for regulators, so if we compete with technology, we will lose. So that's a problem for us right now. So, but still we need to achieve these three goals, as mentioned, as I mentioned. For the society, so the, so the people in the so society needs to have like stabilize financial stability or protect consumers and investors, and also capture criminals. All of this is not for us, for us regulators, but for, not, not just for us, but also for the society as a whole. So the question is how we can achieve these goals even within the decentralized system. So that is the question we, uh, we need to answer, but it's kind of open question right now. Regulators alone will not be able to achieve this. So if, even the like, highest standards or heaviest like, regulation, we cannot achieve this. So that is a reality, but still society need to have these goals. Then regulators need to ask otherwise from the engineers or businesses or even the a larger society to, and then cooperate together to come up with better solution. Just, just not just by regulation, but but also maybe by technology or social norms, market system or businesses. So we need more technology or we need more tools to deal with these issues. That is a difficulty. Um, so I've been interacting with uh, regulators um, in Japan. Uh, for, for a few years now, but I think the biggest challenge that I always feel is um, we, our side understand the regulators' uh, purposes, right? Like, you need to protect consumers, you need to you know, like avoid uh, money laundering and all that. Um, but uh, the, we're, like, our, the community is working on um, this technology to, for the best, better society. And I always wondered, like, how much regulators who are here, like, you know, like you're willing to come to that council, you're more on the understanding side, but I always wonder how much 
uh, flexible the regular can be if they actually have the opportunity to learn uh, like good education about everything that what's happening in in the space. Uh, meaning, I guess, such as like half of the kids in Indonesia they don't have writing education, and it's the currently you can get that. But uh, but it, it's it, how much how, how much the regulation can be can be flexible. It's always when we are communicating, it's really hard. Um, if, if that part is even considered or not, and, and I think it's uh, probably the, the biggest challenge that in really the all other challenges is the lack of education. Because it's so hard for even people in the media to catch up with everything, with the newest updates. And these people here that are, you know, like you guys know the the latest updates on the scaling and also like the indicator of your C20, but that that's not something that regulators can easily get education on, like on a everyday basis. But they have to they have to maintain the regulations also. Before making any regulations, they have to use everything. Like otherwise, once it's yeah, in the uh, regulation, that like, you can't fix it later. To speak to the some of the good that this technology can do for society is that there's this whole other section that, due to certain nuances in regulation or lack of regulation, we now have these huge, massive companies that uh, control our data, control all sorts of things about society and our lives. And that this technology actually uh, could be used to disintermediate some of that, some of these issues with, with other types of technology. And so by squashing it, which I know is not what you in, in, intend to do, at least from your perspective, we, we kind of lose the tools that we're trying to enable, um, enable users. Okay, so. So the biggest challenge for us, maybe for us regulators, maybe the change of, change of the mindset. So at, at least at this moment, the regulator is, is kind of king in the multinational society because if the regulator says something, the, all the banks or all the insurance companies follow us. So it's much easy. It, it's very easy. So just 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 write regulation and then just order something to the, to the financial industry. So that's all. But but right now. It's changing. So if we write regulation, maybe we cannot enforce. So it's it's similar to the internet. So the internet case in the, the late until the late nineteen nineties, maybe. So the telecommunication regulators can can do anything about like telecommunication or mass communication or the content. But but at at a certain point in time, so they lose their power to enforce the regulation. Like like advent of the peer-to-peer -peer file sharing services makes it very difficult for them to prevent the criminal like, activities in the internet or cyberspace. So the financial regulator faces a similar situation right now. So like the peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, so it's much easier for the people to commit crimes in the peer-to-peer -peer basis. And we regulators have no power to enforce regulation on this area. So that's the problem. So so we need the first thing is we need to understand what is happening, and then the second thing is we need to change mindset. So we are not not a, like special power in, in this like space. So so D two is still as Ayasan said. So we need to be learned, educated ourselves to understand the reality, and then then we need to get accustomed to this new reality to find out why. We need to talk with other stakeholders. That is a fundamental difficulty. Yeah, absolutely. I think. Um, by the way, can everybody hear us in the back? Yeah. Um, so I think the, the, the education and the understanding of the technology is super key because otherwise, you know, you regulate something on an understanding of what financial assets were a hundred years ago, and uh, once like ISS, you know, once it is in law, it's hard to change or it's hard to roll back uh, because you have just the decision. Um, so on the one hand, I think actually the whole regulatory landscape in, in, in general government in a large degree has to change a lot because it has to become tax savvy. I mean, tax savvy first. This society is not going back to paper, but everything is still like behaving 
like uh, you know, yeah, and this internet is going away, and the tech is going away, and we will go all back to our shelves with paper in it. Um, it's not going to happen. So this means developers and tech people have to be part of those regulatory bodies first, because they understand then, okay, how does it work, and how could useful um, solutions be applied? I mean, to the triangle we had there on the, uh, or the, the quartet, what it is now. <laughs> um, so the, the situation, oh, here, exactly this one. So the, the goal for the regulators is to create financial stability. Okay, that's a bit more difficult when we talk about um, protocol-based coins because they have a very clear path of how they're issued. So, and um, if people like uh, trade them up and down, you have like movements like in, in, in any market. So it's harder to regulate on that one. In terms of consumer protection, I think it is in the interest of the whole space to build things that protect people. I mean, so far there's nobody <coughs> strongly uh, supporting scam uh, projects on GitHub. <laughs> this is mostly like a very small group of people. Um, and so there's a lot of things we can actually build security on chain. So because we have the ability to program anything, uh, we have the ability to build logic in that makes it safe by design, that makes it fair by design, which then actually removes the need for regulation in the first place. I mean, for example, if people uh, think about <coughs> the ICO wave and then uh, people invest in, in, in scammy projects and uh, end up with nothing, um, you know, if we build a system and some one, for example, I have proposed, um, if you are basically uh, putting this money in a smart contract and give it over time to the project, <coughs> you would immediately create safety for the user uh, or for the investor because now he has the ability to reverse his decision at any point in time and his basically risk increases over time, which is a very clear thing to see. So things like these formal moments where people rush in, think they don't get in anymore, don't even scroll down the website and then send money, only to realize they actually bought something different than they thought, you know, that, that becomes impossible if we make it smart and fair by design. And through that, we don't need to create, um, you know, like, try to apply all of these security laws, for example, we have uh, to the blockchain world because it really makes things impossible. And it also takes away the whole user experience. You know, I mean, one thing why ICOs were so awesome were because it was the first decentralized, anonymous crowd sale ever in history. So you could actually just participate very simply and just because you wanted to. Um, today, actually, a lot of the security laws are seen more as a restriction of the small investor to participate in financial markets. Not necessarily, as, I mean, the whole like security token thing, um, I mean, even people that are saving the space can't be investors anymore now because they have to have a million on their bank account. And so this means the guy with the million can make more money and the, the guy with like his thousand bucks cannot invest because of regulation, you know? So we have to really rethink how we apply it. And when it comes to um, traceability and, and preventing misconduct, um, this one solution is by using on-chain uh, smart contract-based accounts, we can attach uh, KYC information in terms of uh, not detailed information, but a let's say a, a signature that this account is known to some people, like some regulators. And then, if that person does anything, he can do it as easy as he did before by simply sending transactions. But in case there's any wrongdoing, you could check who that person is. Um, and this, for example, would be a way of circumventing that. What do you want to say something else? <laughs> no, that, but, but, and I, I very much agree that like, through mechanism design, we can do all sorts of things that add in consumer protections and add in uh, certain guarantees that maybe we traditionally had to get through regulations. But all of this hinges upon a programmable environment. And just as easily as you can program these things, and maybe people might choose to opt into certain types of mechanisms, you can program uh, all sorts of other things, right? So you can program, like, if you have a decentralized blockchain, and if you can program on top of it, then you can program these zero knowledge things such that the regulators can't see, uh, and, and you can't track, and you can't trace. And, and if people don't opt into the mechanisms that the government would 
agree with, then that it doesn't ultimately help regulation. And the um, <laughs> so one short thing. The problem is also is that if you now would regulate this uh, by preventing certain things, for example, you can say, okay, you cannot use zero knowledge coins, but you can use uh, you know this uh, um, KYC uh, account you created here. The problem is you are not preventing criminal activity at all. You know, you just make, like, forbidding encryption is the most stupid idea ever. I mean, like, uh, a terrorist wouldn't say, oh my god, it's illegal to use encryption, let's not encrypt right now. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I mean, this is just na very naive approaches, which on the end prevent, the, prevent the, the good use cases from not happening uh, because of a stupid law. You know? And so, it does seem like the, the binary of this is allowed and this is not allowed in this decentralized context fails to work. <laughs> um, and I and I don't know the new proper route, but we should have to do that. I guess that, that when, 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 when zero knowledge happens, and they would need to know then what's possible within that range, right? Which we mean this 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 new new like, when it's still being researched, like it would it would, it would help for them to know. That's, that's a, that conversation is probably not happening. And when it's done, when it's when it becomes the product, the way it's done, 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 the way it's done
like other solutions or better solutions. So, so this will, this conversation will like in cooperation between the regulators and the engineers to come up with better solutions. So in that case, probably the technology will help us to solve the social problems, not, not just in financial system, but also in the other areas as well. OK, well, maybe uh, uh, Boris, as Boris says, uh, blockchain technology achieved the more provided decentralization, more you know, fair trade or something. But uh, on the other hand, uh, we have to look at the current situation. So, uh, they are a big tech company here, so they are very hyper centralized. <laughs> so, uh, as I said, uh, you know, we are currently looking at the economic in in intermediary services. So, uh, uh, of course, we are looking at the uh, blockchain technologies, you know, uh, uh, in the first motivation by Satoshi's paper. So, uh, they uh, seek for the, uh, the fully P2P based transaction, very fair trades. But uh, in reality, we have uh, intermediate services such as uh, exchanges. So, if we, you know, in the future, we eliminate such services, so uh, we accomplish the perfect uh, decentralization, perfect fair trade system. But currently, uh, we are in the process of, of the uh, decentralization. But uh, you know, in current situation, so uh, we are, you know. On the other hand, we are, you know, we have the big tech company very hyper centralized. So, uh, you know, we are very concerned about the uh, kind of the, the, the competition, competitive, you know, competition uh, aspect. So, uh, of course, the uh, uh, in current situation, we are looking at the uh, both aspects, the hyper centralized and the, uh, you know, the, 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 the process of decentralization. So, uh, I think the uh, uh, both of them is a very, uh, you know, we are, you know. Uh, we are very much concerned about the uh, <coughs> kind of situation. But uh, currently, uh, we have very fragmented situation. But uh, you know, one side is by high percentage, the other side is uh, the, the process of the participants. Uh, so th th that's why so, uh, we have to uh, look at the, the you know, uh, various situation uh, in the current development. But at the same time, this then, uh, I mean, there is like, for example, the exchanges, these are entities which can be uh, audited, right? Um, and actually, most exchanges are really like completely compliant by now. I mean, there's barely an exchange that is not an if, it has almost no volume. I mean, BTCE and so on, that doesn't even exist anymore. Uh, or Crypti, or what we had back then. Um, but I think, because it's such a different nature of assets, because it can be so much more, we have to think a little bit beyond that because we end up um, regulating them everything, including like tokenized uh, ha houses or communities or um, you know something made up by people like Dogecoin. Um, you know, you start to regulate them everything under a, a financial rule, for example, when we talk about securities, there is a promise of potential future return of the company, um, that's not necessarily the same. You know, you don't have the same with any of the other uh, assets. Nor do you have voting rights, maybe in some kind of stakeholdership. Uh, maybe it's just a purely decentralized communal <coughs> community that where the coin has meaning and nothing else. Uh, and, and when you regulate it the same way, you just create a lot of friction, which will push the people. And that's the, the beauty of technology. It will push the people out. For example, if we ask people to uh, say, hey, if you make a private coin, make a audit a key in there, there's a few reasons why it wouldn't happen. First reason is you create a vulnerability in your system by design, which is like exactly the worst thing <laughs> you could do. So this regulator body could also be hacked. Uh, data could be leaked. Um, so you end up with a you know, Facebook-like problem. Um, and on the other hand, people would just not use it then. They would tend rather to, to use the other one. And because people can just make up these coins, installing software and downloading software is really easy, uh, people will... So if you want to get the terrorists or the evil doers or the wrongdoers from or, from... or you want to catch them, then they might not be in this system then. They might be in the other system where you cannot look in. So the thing is, it's, it's like, like, you, like you said initially, 
it's a catching a ghost. Yeah, it will be impossible. So it's rather smarter to think, okay, how can we build systems that are, that are by design fair and better done? And the intent of most people is to actually adopt systems that make sense for everybody. I mean, if somebody comes along and says, I have this pyramid scheme and I will win on the end, there's not many people rallying around that, except if there's like a little benefit for each one along the way. Um, so we have already this natural tendency of trying to make things fair and, and useful for everybody. We just now have to figure out the behavior and the economics, uh, how to do that. And crypto economics and token economics, how they call it or whatever, um, that's actually a new way of doing that, how you direct behavior in a better way and not just like from top down. Speaking of building systems, maybe a directed question to Danny. So, um, over the last couple of days, we've been hearing about the transition to proof of stake. Um, and so, we've also been hearing about the importance of non financial use cases. Um, what are some of the unique features of proof of stake systems, for instance, that you see that fall outside of current regulatory frameworks? Right. <laughs> uh, great question. So, some people look at, say, a proof of stake system and maybe begin to look at it like a security, or maybe like that it's gambling or things like that, but it's, it's actually this whole new thing where it's, a, it's kind of like access to participate in the joint creation uh, and, and construction of a protocol that then can be rewarded, or uh, at the same time, risk. And so th this, this doesn't look like anything, really, that, that we have on the books. Um, and, and is it's kind of a whole new and emerging thing. Um, and then, of course, all the things that you can build on the highly scalable system that we are creating, like none of these things is sort of the same for you. So um, it, is, it, is, it is an unknown, and, and I, I, um, I know that some people are, are worried that these things might be attempted to be regulated in, in more traditional ways, whereas they don't quite fit into the, into the buckets. Yep, so just continuing that, maybe opening it up to the regulators in the panel. Um, a, one way that people talk about proof of stake, uh, ETH2, is that the um, deposit smart contract, as an example, is a sort of an investment, and the um, validator rewards are sort of interest earned. And so that automatically brings to mind the analogy of a bank. Um, and so I'm wondering, from a regulatory perspective, um, how you're looking at emerging proof of stake systems, not just Ethereum, and thinking about existing classifications. So it's, <coughs> it's, it's a very difficult question because, so it, in the superficial, <coughs> superficially, it seems like the banking activities or like this similar to other like incumbent financial activities, but in reality, the 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 if we look into details, probably it's lots of differences, like the economics within the system, or the incentives, or maybe the legal nature. So, so every every like implementation has slightly different features, and then we need to look into all the different features to understand the actual actual like, economic meaning of the legal. The, the meaning from the economic perspectives or legal perspectives to understand how we should deal with, and then maybe as a as a consequence, maybe it falls within the, the incumbent or existing regulatory framework, but maybe it's not. So still, this kind of discussion is, I think, it's not happening right now. So, so as far as I know, no like <coughs> regulators actually look into this proof of stake system to think about how we should deal with because because we within our limited capacity or limited knowledge technical knowledge it's very difficult to like see what looking matter so it, it's still early stage in the development so not no like like Ethereum is still not in the like proof of stake so if Ethereum moves into proof of stake. Maybe we need to think about, it. but at this moment, it's it's not like urgent, immediate issues. So, as far as I know, no like regulators have clear understanding, clear idea how we should deal with this issue. So that is a reality right now. 
So maybe picking back on that, a question I have for you. What do you see as the role of the Ethereum Foundation in educating not just regulators, but other global stakeholders on these new uh, challenges and opportunities? So um, we just pulled ourselves as a resource allocator the other day. And, and then, but that means even just, you know, like I, I asked these people to join this discussion. And, and that's uh, whether it's from the within the Ethereum Foundation or in the community, we do have experts in all these. And, and maybe I hate like, when we talk about the folks that we mentioned about what some people would see this in the semester. The moment someone starts <laughs> seeing that way, I hate that it's just that um, it's going to be put into like one existing category in that trigger some reaction that has happened before. Um, instead of that, I like I think we should keep having these conversation, and then they can figure out. Oh, maybe it's not the time for us to even think about it yet. And that's possible if someone like Danny can sit next to each other, and then you know, like you, you can just share all oh, this is what's happening, and then there's nothing you need to worry about. Like, if there's this transformation, <laughs> I'm not saying I'm going to give all the pressure of Danny here, but, but um, but if that's possible for a regulator, and then I think uh, like like Fabian said, it would be great if regulators actually have uh, more more tech savvy people, which is which I'm very uh, um, it, impressed and also um, grateful that that you you two are joining here and then you you already have learned about the technology compared to a few years ago, which wasn't the case when I was having a conversation with you. That, I think it's, I hope it's improving that way, but for us to, I think the EF slow is, we're not never going to control the regulatory direction, but we do have access to all the community members who is knowledge about each, you know, the, you know like the, the project or um, the new technology that's happening, and, and we can just point to that, or we can sometimes provide some educational um, like if, if EF has expert within ourselves, we're happy to support that, but also we can reach other members in the community. And I, I think it's always, you know, education changes a lot of things, and without that, we tend to have a lot of miscommunication and also misunderstanding, and then that can really trigger a very, very important way. What's interesting is that you know, you're not looking at proof of stake yet, and maybe when it comes, you'll look at it then. That, that sentiment can actually, uh, like I know you want, to, you want to encourage innovation and encourage innovation in these areas. That sentiment can actually be discouraging, uh, because then all sorts of people that are interested in the evaluators, if someone from a regulatory agency signals, we're going to deal with that later, but we're going to deal with it. Uh, that actually, that, that puts all of a sudden like, a lot of unknown and risk uh, whereas, you know, if, if especially if you at least begin to understand the technology sooner and at least like put out maybe not formal policies but memos and things that will let people in, uh, be aware of, of like the conversations that you've had and, and the way you're beginning to think about these things. And I will say, uh, just the way that we do look at uh, the mistakes, it's more of like you're, you're providing a service uh, to the protocol and to um, to the Ethereum community, and in, in doing so, uh, you you have certain risks associated, and can receive certain certain rewards. So it, it looks more like providing, like being sort of like a business and, and providing um, providing services rather than like a straight kind of investment in the traditional security. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the big I think the big fear we is um, for most people in this space that, that okay, I'm doing this now, but tomorrow I need a license. You know, that's the problem. I mean. If, you know, people sell stuff on the street all the time, it's not a big deal. But like now, because it's somewhat like money, means you need a license, and then this license costs like uh, a lot of money, which might not even be that big of a problem. But the problem is that it mostly takes a lot of time. So 
you want to build a, a business and then you have to like sit there for two years waiting for a hopeful yes. <laughs> That's just not going to work for any startup. And uh, we really, yeah. Yeah, so I think it's just that, 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 let's say the proof of stake is happening, but we've been having this discussion for, for a long time. I give that something in the community. But if, it, if, it, if this is like, okay, proof of stake, da da, tomorrow. <laughs> like it's a deep very and then that, that would be like a big problem. And I I wish regulations also happen this way, like have a lot of incubation time, uh, so that people would be ready or can actually modify before it's actually set into uh, regulation. Yeah. So so re the usually regulators take this approach, like, this, if the ecosystem is small enough, we can just ignore. <laughs> and then if the ecosystem <laughs> reach to a certain point of level of the importance in the society or the system, we need to regulate. So <laughs> this is a typical like, attitude. So but I think it's, sometimes it's better for the ecosystem because they can, like, at least reach certain like level of importance and then if it's become important probably you have certain kind of the like negotiating power with the regulators <laughs> that is the one important thing but at the same time as, as you mentioned like as that is very really, like <coughs> uh, things we need to avoid so if we have open platform to discuss these kind of issues among regulators engineers or even the businesses uh, these kind of issues. It, it is very good for even for us to understand what are your concerns. And then we can talk together to come up with like better way to deal with this issue. Just, so if, if the community want, want us to just ignore, probably it's okay. Like this, like regret your sandbox kind of thing. Not, not regret your kind of sandbox is not ignoring, but still we can give some freedom to the experiment. And if you have more like clear guidance or clear like framework from us on, on the some of the issues, probably we need to like make some effort within the regulatory community to come up with how we should deal with the proof of stake or something. So at this moment we are in the kind of the middle of the like kind of the haze or fog or something. So we, it's very difficult to understand what is happening and what is important in the community. So at least we, if we have open channel to like learn what is happening and what is concerned, even even for the community side or technology side, I, I hope that for, for the community side, probably if if the regulators like like give some like clear guidance or clear idea of what we are concerned with. Probably the community or the tech, tech, engine, tech community may make some effort to help the regulators. So, so this kind of the, like information sharing and then help each other to like make things smoothly, more, more, like more smoothly things happen will be important. Okay. So uh, I think the, uh, we have to you know, make a clear message to the uh, safe harbor, <laughs> maybe. So, uh, but uh, um, as uh, you just said, that uh, our stressful day, you know, to set the thresholds is. Uh, very difficult for us. So we also understand, that, you know, uh, under the fast-paced uh, technological innovation, so uh, a lot of people need a kind of safe harbor, uh, uh, you know, regulated not to touch such areas. So, but uh, uh, we are al always thinking of the, such a kind of concept in the you know, border level. But uh, mm, always uh, it's difficult to set the uh, threshold <laughs> to set the uh, kind of. Uh, uh, safe, safe zone, safe area. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, uh, of course, uh, we are challenged. But uh, uh, through the you know stakeholders discussion, so uh, we would like to you know set a, we you know, may not be set the 
PM in a sense form. But uh, we would like to, uh, you know, uh, to work to more closely to the uh, that kind of the innovation side. So, uh, so I think the uh, the process of the, the stakeholder discussion is, uh, is very uh, important. So to 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 you know make closer to the uh, innovation side. So, um, I mean, I think like a very concrete action point, and I would really like to see this in a, a lot of more departments, not just like in financial services, uh, is actually to hire a department of developers that are part of and watching what is going on. Because on the end, everything in this space, to 99%, is out in the open. But actually, the internet is very expensive for us to hire. So, <laughs> yeah, so that is a problem as well. So, they talk not, I'm not sure they talk much, but the, the very like, competent engineers. So, the competent engineers is very expensive for us to hire. So, the, the shortage of the talent is, is common like, issues. Not, not just in the but also in the like, entire ecosystem. So we need to have more engineers as an ecosystem. And then if there is a kind of, if, if we have lots of engineers, probably we can hire some, some of them. But at this moment, it's very difficult to hire. Japan just raised the tax, so That is a good point. Yeah. <laughs> Arguably, there's probably immense value to having more engineers involved in government. Uh, so it might be worth it. <laughs> you, thank you. You've made my job as a moderator very, very easy because this is an active panel. But um, you're the most important part of this panel. So I wanted to take an opportunity to open it up for questions. You can see I have a stack of questions. So, but please. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is Jacek. I work for MakerDAO's so legal counsel. Uh, your your presentation at the beginning was really great. Uh, it was it was excellent to see such like good understanding of, of the problems that are being and challenges that are being posed by decentralized finance. And to be honest, after interacting with quite a few regulators, that was that was that was really excellent. So please continue this work, uh, especially at this level of standard setting bodies, so that the, all of these guys like actually uh, understand what's going on and see this not just as risk, but a certain new uh, like uh, paradigm that, that might happen at some point of time, might become reality and, and mainstream. Uh, and I think that this idea of uh, interacting with stakeholders and the forum, uh, stakeholder forum that you mentioned for next year, it's, it's another excellent idea because that's, that's what, you, what we need. And you, uh, like some may think that there is no um, like counterparty or like the discussion participants from the other side, from the DeFi side. But actually today I, I was uh, leading a workshop to, um, called um, Legal Troubleshooting for DeFi Projects. Okay. And I was presenting certain problems to the community of, of people that, that gathered at this workshop, uh, legal problems for DeFi. And I was, ask, I was asking them for solutions. And actually those that were like winning options in these polls I was doing were like uh, educate regulators, uh, engage in transparent dialogue with lawmakers, um, and things like that, right? Uh, try to influence and change the laws. These were like the winning options. Uh, so there is, uh, I feel, a very strong willingness uh, in the DeFi community and broader speak, broadly, more broadly speaking, uh, blockchain community to engage in, dialogue, in this dialogue as well to try to tackle this, uh, these problems that you outlined that might, might seem unsolvable right now. Uh, but, you know, these are uh, at the most fundamental level societal problems or challenges that we somehow need to solve, right? If, if that's going to happen. We'll just need to do that, uh, and like things like this panel on, and the discussion, like the, the one that you're organizing at the stakeholder forum, is just necessary. And I think that everyone understands this. Sorry, that was not the question. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> great feedback. Yeah, great feedback. Yeah. So I would like to just add one thing to this multi stakeholder. Um, it, so, so the benefit, for example, for having developers, and I think there's people ways to motivate them. Um, it's saying, but not only saying, hey, sit here and look at the internet, but actually you have to also contribute open source things. Come up with good ways of making smart contracts for safe investment or whatever. Because if you give them good tasks, these people are happy to join because they want to work on interesting problems. If they're now there to be the GitHub watchdog, they're probably not liking that job. And neither would anybody want to have them around. Um, so if they contribute, then it's useful. Um, on the multi-stakeholder um, aspect, I mean, 
what I'm seeing is, for example, that uh, there are panels made here, for example, like this. The problems with it is that it's like 40 minutes short talk, maybe uh, even in public with other people. So there is no real fast discussions. And if you then do like five panels over two years, you have exchanged very little information in, in these two years, you know, because there's like five meetings. So what it actually requires is to have those in-house developers basically being on the scene, helping out themselves, developing ideas themselves, um, being part of the community, then they're always on the tab. And then actually having, inviting for, for example, one day, let's sit together in discussion on a more internal basis. Because there's a lot of people who have ideas and they would like to talk about these things. Um, but it cannot be that always the super um, standardized form. It has to be just a room and then people talk, for example. Uh, I'm Alexander Kivich. I'm representing the consultants and the price here. And my question is, we have a lot of projects sitting now at the table, like this, they represent everything. Could you please outline in a short word, uh, how do you uh, imagine, or how do you see from what you know right now, the regulatory uh, position or role in 10 years? And what do you think would be the, uh, like, your role, like your party role, in that period, coming the truth, coming the reality? Because it's very interesting how the different angles of this view. So, that is a very good point because in 10 years, probably the centralized system will be more much larger, and then probably the regulatory like, landscape or the role of regulation will be changed. So, as Fabian mentioned, so part of the regulation or regulatory enforcement will be replaced by the technology. So that some people call this as a like code as code as I, I think it's it's too broad, but the, some of the part of the controlling system will be replaced by the technology or code itself. In that sense, regulators need to like have ability to get into the code development as well. Or the engineers have certain level of understanding of the social issues. Or this so, job. Yeah, or, or just <laughs> really job. So, so if we fail to like catch up catching up this like pattern change, we will lose job just. Yeah. So that, that so so kind of the code development itself is maybe the politics. So code itself represents some of the values. So like how much anonymity is or privacy is like appropriate in the society or this kind of thing. So the, there's certain politics based on the code development itself. So but at this moment the most of the values from the engineering side is reflected in the code. But I think it's it's a little bit too dangerous because the other perspective from the regulators or consumers or other, other perspective from the society is not reflected in the code, but still the code acts as kind of the controlling system. So we need to change the political system or the regulatory system according to, accordingly with the social change or the change of the, the paradigm. So that, that, is, that takes a long time, like not, not within one year or two years, but maybe in 10 years we need to think about this kind of change. So I, I don't know if the code necessarily, at least the core protocol, I don't know if it necessarily reflects the engineer's intentions other than making something generally extensible and programmable. The, obviously the technologies that we build on top reflect our intentions and, and engineers are the main ones designing these mechanisms currently. Um, and so I think the regulatory position in 10 years is probably not going to be governing protocols. It's probably not going to be, be governing the base layer technology and it's instead hopefully going to be taking part in standards and, the, and mechanism design in such a way that it can help enable society to use these things in productive ways. I also think in 10 years that everything will be able to be done in zero knowledge um, and that most blockchains at that time might even have their core state transitions simply as zero knowledge proofs that update state routes that uh, are completely opaque to those that are not participating in individual transactions. So um, I'll be happy to have conversations then about how those things work. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, 
anything. But but I think, uh, like Danny said, it's uh, if the record side is going to be more than watching the record being designed, and then the blockchain can do uh, like create our own mechanism design, but also can help regulate, not like or govern um, the mechanism design side too. So like the for as a EF, I, I can't really speak about continuity, <laughs> but. But uh, like again, like we we will we will always facilitate and support the best possible way for the ecosystem. And if that is something that to, to provide experts or um, to provide the places places for discussion, that's what I what we would do. Um, or I don't know if it's me, but I just I will see the that. But <laughs> but um. Yeah, so hopefully the technology will be something like like a helpful helpful tool for regulators too. Yeah, which which you know, really happens. Um, I think like in the next uh, so I'm super interested in the in the future. <laughs> so I'm, I'm very much thinking a lot about uh, what's coming and how it's coming. Uh, ten years is though a, a, a long time frame. Even though when it happens, it happens faster than we think. So think about 10 years ago, that's like yesterday, right? I mean, like 2011, uh, 12, 9, that was like kind of around the corner almost, how it feels. Yeah. Um, but um, I, th I think as society, there's a lot of big, big shifts coming. So the digital will be completely immersive. See virtual reality and AR. People will spend a lot of time in those worlds as well. In these worlds, blockchain will be the absolute core basis this will be the law of nature in these worlds. So, like what do you own, what do you transfer, your money, uh, what you can do, what you cannot do. It, the blockchain can govern everything here, right? In the real world, the blockchain can govern only so and so much because there's still like the physical world. Uh, in these digital realms, it's 100%. Um, I think definitely as the society is moving towards this very much more digital age, um, regulators have to become programmers. I mean, I think it has to be a I'm sorry to say that, but it has to be a requirement to code <laughs> and to understand and to actually uh, participate uh, in these open discussions. And one of the things which open source shows us is that you can have open discussions about a lot of very important things. And today it's not anymore like little games, but it's like multi-billion dollar ecosystems that are in public discussed. And it works pretty well in such a, in a, in a way. I mean, there's a, obviously a lot of processes it could be more organized or better structured, but it's at least already very transparent. So I think the future regulators will understand that certain roles, it right now does, are not necessary anymore as such, because the systems just work different. So you can build rules in that make systems safe by design, so a certain set of regulatory needs is not even required anymore and um, actually being part of the mechanism design and the crypto economics I think, because I think this will be a very big part of our political discord and society governing society will be thinking of those systems in the right way. So after 10 years, so, uh, we are still fighting with the new challenges. <laughs> <Maybe>. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, uh, through the discussion, the round table, a uh, blockchain round table uh, last month, so uh, we are, uh, you know, uh, of course, yeah, we, we invited uh, uh, the engineers, uh, academics, and uh, experts of security. So uh, I think the, uh, we, uh, we can uh, access to the, uh, the relevant person of the, uh, such kind of area. But uh, finally, you know, we have discussed in the round table, so uh, who represents the user side? So maybe uh, user motivation is very changeable. So uh, of course the technology changes services, but uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, on the other hand, so uh, users change the service itself. So uh, you know, uh, after you know, 10, ten years ago, so uh, we have you know, we had a smartphone first. So. Uh, during 10 years, so we change the financial service itself. So uh, after, uh, uh, maybe after 10 years, user change the services. So uh, we are <laughs> maybe fighting <laughs> with new challenges. Maybe maybe by the users of something else. Okay. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you for that. Do you want a microphone? Uh, I'm working with some uh, talk strangers as a strategy advisor, and uh, I found that there's a missing uh, picture of um, a missing part of the whole picture, and uh, maybe some of those key exchanges like Binance and OKX and OB, they are not actually invited to join this kind of discussion, and uh, although there are a lot of those something like the malicious manipulation of the price and the managerial issues are around here, but still those guys, they are the, somehow like a portal for a lot of those companies entering the token world. So I would like to know your ideas. So whether you somehow uh, like those bureaus, uh, bureaus or those kind of agencies are going to collaborate or cooperate with those key exchanges to shape the future coming regulatory environmental situations for all those kind of those issues regarding the cryptocurrency tokens, or you are going to just leave those guys aside, because <laughs> nowadays they're actually quite passive. Uh, so I would like to know your ideas. It's a, it's a very good question uh, and a good comment. So uh, I think the, uh, you know, we are regular viewers already, so uh, we have to be fair <laughs> in storytelling. So uh, I think the, uh, uh, we, we impose the regulation to the crypto exchanges, so uh, we have you know, some conflict. So uh, because there are some exchanges uh, uh, you know, provided the kind of the, the, uh, under the process of the registration to, to our agency. So, but uh, we, are, we have such a conflict. But uh, of course, the, uh, we uh, would like to uh, discuss with the uh, the major uh, exchanges. So uh, you, you would like to know the uh, the, the concern of the businesses uh, uh, possessed by the, uh, the exchange services. So, uh, but uh, we have you know we have two challenges in you know, organizing the uh, kind of uh, the stakeholders. So. Uh, but uh, so I think the, uh, it's better to organize the uh, you know uh, uh, for you know it's better for you know academic sites you know they are very neutral. So uh, I think it's better to uh, better for you know academic uh, kind of people to organize the kind of the, uh, the kind of stakeholder discussion. So uh, I think uh, relatively going to be relatively fair. Right? So. Uh, this is a, you know, my, 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 my uh, Maybe a short addition to this. Um, the problem with the uh, academic side, I see that they're actually pretty far behind that whole thing as well. I mean, you think, uh, you know, the academia is the one on the cutting edge and they're doing all the research, but the, the truth is that um, it's just catching up <laughs> to what's happening here in the blockchain space. They are almost like the, the government institution. Some, you know, there are some small groups which are a bit more advanced, like MIT Lab and so on, um, but that's very few people. Um, I think like inviting, so if the university is inviting these groups to make discussions, I think that's useful. I personally uh, think I know like um, agencies like this have to be neutral by design and because there could be the potential scene uh, that, you know, this exchange tries to influence the regulator, which does it to its benefit, <clears throat> but I think Actually, everybody should be invited, and it should be openly talked. And it doesn't matter from which side, because on the end, the talk is open, you know. And then you can see if somebody got like influence or not, and if somebody moved the package of crypto coins over or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> the exchanges are only right now. There are very obvious places to to regulate, like because they're the on and off ramps for most users. Um, but the more and more the assets and, and contracts and, and just general activities built on top of these systems, they, they might become less and less important. Um, from kind of like, they might still serve some sort of economic purpose and they're a place to regulate, but they might not be like the, the kind of golden gates that you regulate everything. Yeah, I agree. So, so I agree with the, the discussion should be open to everyone. So if, if the 
if students who want to join our discussion, we wish they should do. And also, I'm not sure the decentralized exchanges will like be widely spread out in in coming two or three years because there are lots of issues. But but as as you mentioned, like the exchange is still a very important part of the ecosystem to, in terms of the regulation because in the in the system basically exchange is the only one place to re regulate. So so if we if we eradicate exchanges from the ecosystem we cannot regulate it. <laughs> so, on one hand we need to protect <laughs> like in, in, in this sense we need to like promote exchanges. But at the same time centralized. Yeah. So we need to have some certain centralization to regulate. But at the same time we, we cannot like like dictate or the like uh, the control of the development. So, so if the exchanges become less important, maybe the challenge will be much bigger than now for us. So it's it's very like, complicated dynamics <laughs> in the ecosystem. So the regulators, exchanges, and decentralization. So it's it's very interesting topic. To, I think there's no like common understanding even among regulators, how we think about the decentralization in terms of the trading platform. So at this moment, it's the decentralized exchange is very small, so we can just not ignore, but still we can we can have some time to run. But if it is widespread, probably it's much more difficult. <laughs> I think I think it's just that the conversation with exchanges is actually were, were happening more I think with regulators because um, before in the case of Japan before the regulators created the regulation that they are discussing with um, exchanges of course but the problem I saw was when, when you know when Japan decided okay let's let's regulate like let's ban all the um, um, like anonymous and, and it's all at once uh, without knowing what each token, like what technology each token represent. That part was missing, and that's why what, what was needed is actually the education of, of learning of actually what, what, what is behind each token. And that's not possible just by regulating exchanges. And I thought of, um, that I was there so I just thought I would wish there was more platform to, to discuss and educate like environment of sex. Not everything is, <laughs> is the same, but also there, this is not going to begin to to create like more more criminals or more more bad things. And then um, so there's no discussion about that there as far as I know about the exchanges that the purpose of all this is actually the conversation with researchers and robots who are actually building things were missing. And, and I think that's, this is something new, and that's why this is more important. So I think we're at the end of our time, and I wanted to piggyback on the question about the 10-year horizon and connect it with Niwa-san, your presentation about a 300-year horizon, to encourage <laughs> us leaving this panel to think, and perhaps in those terms as well, as we think about broader regulatory strategies. Um, I wanted to thank all of the panelists for participating. I especially would like to thank Niwa-san, uh, Takanashi-san, for not just being our guests here at DEF CON, but also being our hosts here in Japan. Um, so thank you, thank you everybody for participating.